Spoilers ahead. Watch out, and take care. During World War II, the movie recounts the story of a group of women, imprisoned by the Japanese on the Indonesian island of Sumatra, utilize music to alleviate their suffering. The movie begins with a bunch of soldiers, dancing with their companions at Singapore's Raffles Hotel. It is an excellent stress relief for them, because they fought against Japan during World War II. We meet Susan, an Australian nurse, who is dancing with a man she met at the party. Similarly, Rosemary, a woman in her 20s, is dancing with her army husband, with whom she is madly in love. A group of American men and women are debating how the Japanese could never beat the Americans at a nearby table. Outside, a tremendous explosion is heard. A man interrupts the party to announce that Japanese soldiers have barged in through the borders, they're on their way to the city, and could assault at any time. Today, all women and children are requested to board a ship, that will carry them to a safer destination. As all males are assigned to the front lines, the partners say their goodbyes shortly, before the women rush to board the ship. As the ship sails, the Australian nurse attends to the requirements of the passengers, and mingles with them. To ensure their safety, everyone on board is given life jackets to wear for a few hours. The night passes without incident, but in the morning, Japanese planes launch missiles at the ship. The passengers are in a frenzy as they try to save their lives. Several are killed in the attack, but a few jump onto a lifeboat and sail to the neighboring island. Rosemary, who was separated from her husband, Susan, the Australian nurse, and Adrienne, an American lady, are left behind in the ocean. They swim for an entire day before reaching Sumatra shore. After navigating a muddy forest, they make their way ahead. The first person they see is a Japanese soldier on a bicycle, who is followed by a line of such soldiers who pedal past the women. Then Captain Tanaka of the Japanese force offers them a ride to the first town. On their way, Adrienne reminds them of the error his troops made, when they attacked a ship full of women and children, their actions violated the Geneva Convention, but the captain reveals that Japan never signed it. A Japanese sergeant slaps Rosemary for no apparent reason, when the women are dropped off in town. He then drags them into a larger crowd. The ladies and children who were saved in the lifeboat are taken to the island as well. Susan reunites with her nurse friends, and expresses gratitude that they are safe. Following that, the troops forcibly transport them to a prison camp that already houses prisoners of various backgrounds. They are given a shed to share with hundreds of other ladies. The inmates are woken up the next morning by soldiers, who treat them like animals. The colonel informs them that they are now prisoners of the Japanese government, and must follow their regulations. A woman attempts to cut him off, but is thwarted by the sergeant. While their national anthem plays in the background, the soldiers force them to bow to the Japanese flag. After a while, a truck arrives with leftover meat and vegetables, which the inmates cook and ration out to the 400 of them. While chatting, the women recognize that they are from various countries and social classes, including Dutch English Irish Portuguese Chinese and Australian. There is some animosity between some English and Dutch women, but everyone chooses to live in peace for the duration of their stay in the camp. We're introduced to Verstak, a Jewish woman. She claims to be a doctor, and is close to the Japanese soldiers due to her competence. When asked where she is from, she says she was not allowed to interact with upper-class people like them when she was outside. After breakfast, they're forced to do field work all day. They have to defecate in a bucket full of water, and can't rest if they're fatigued. One of their responsibilities is to get water for the soldiers to wash in, and while they're doing it, the soldiers stroll around naked, which surprises the conservative women. One of them who has been in the camp for a long time, circulates reports about a men's camp on the other side of the mountain. While everyone dismisses it, Rosemary is fascinated, because it means her husband could be on the other side. A malaria pandemic develops among the convicts in just a few weeks, killing some and rendering others bedridden. Mrs. Roberts, the group's oldest member, also catches the disease. Even after the disaster on the ship, she had brought her puppy with her, it is her sole support animal, but other women pray she dies, so they can cook her pet. It demonstrates that even the most respected members of society are left as slaves to their human instincts, when they face death. When more individuals fall ill, medicine becomes scarce, forcing them to obtain quinine by bartering their earrings with soldiers. Wing, a Chinese woman takes on the task, and sneaks outdoors at night. She successfully crosses the barrier and exchanges the medicine, but several guards are alerted. Finally, she returns to the shed without being discovered. Mrs. Roberts is given the medicine, which significantly benefits her, but Captain Tanaka discovers what happened last night. He brings Wing to the front and burns her as punishment, while the others look terrified. Adrienne is humming a song that evening, when she is joined by an older woman named Daisy. They bond over their shared passion for music, and decide to create a female voice orchestra. 
Some women detest writing musical notes on notebooks, because they are terrified of the Japanese, but others are anxious to join the group. Mrs. Robert recovers completely, and begins to complain about having to live with people from the lower classes. On the other hand, her daughter affirms that Wing died while attempting to save her life. Mrs. Robert feels embarrassed about what she said. The next morning, Adrienne and Daisy begin the first orchestra practice, which is quickly interrupted by the military. They beat and drag them for doing something they weren't supposed to do, but the ladies don't want to give up. They establish a smaller group, and rehearse in remote locations to avoid detection by the army. The plan works, and they are able to make significant progress. The sergeant arrives at the shed one day, shoving every woman in his path. He hands Daisy a list of names, and after some thought, they conclude that the women on the list are all young and gorgeous. They are loaded into a car, and driven to a residence inhabited by the highest Japanese officials. A translator informs them that they will be offered a better life, if they accept to be the mistresses of the officials, they will be provided with silk sheets, decent food, and their own apartments. While some of the women think the offer is ridiculous, others believe it is promising. Some of the women decide to take the job. Many more months pass, yet the war does not stop. With passing time, several women are killed in the camp. Adrienne persuades Susan and her friends to join her orchestra. Susan walks into Dr. Verstack's hut one day, and finds her hammering a gold tooth out of a dead body. She claims it is useless to the owner, but may be valuable to her in the future. Susan initially believes the doctor's actions are wrong, but it turns out that Verstack exchanges gold for medicine with Japanese soldiers. She wants Susan to master all of the strategies, so that she can keep the inmates alive in the event that the doctor is assassinated one day. Adrienne is outside the shed that night, when an intoxicated soldier attacks and attempts to assault. She defends herself effectively, and shoves him into a puddle, but the other soldiers approach and accuse her of striking a soldier for no reason. She is imprisoned in a cage for the night, in order for the convocation to take place. The sun rises the next day, and she is led in front of Captain Tanaka. He is deceived by the soldier, who claims that he only touched her because she refused to bow to him. When Adrienne tries to tell her story, the captain assumes that she is insulting the Japanese soldiers. He shoves her to the ground and brutally kicks her. The other women, meanwhile, go to the colonel's office, and vouch for Adrienne. They ask him to be fair and let her go, because the soldier was to blame. He is initially hesitant, but when they compare him to Captain Tanaka, he chooses to assist. That night, the symphony performs its first show, surprising the Japanese soldiers. Even though the soldiers are commanded to halt, they are unable to do so, because they are enthralled by the music. Towards the end, even the leaders are applauding for the ladies. The prisoners are collected next, and informed that Japan has achieved a greater victory in the war, and that Australia now wishes to join forces with it. Susan huffs and curses under her breath, but Captain Tanaka appears to have heard her. He summons her to the front, and requests that she repeat what she said. As she refuses to comply, he has the troops kneel down and trap her in such a way, that she will be stabbed to death if she moves. She is trapped for hours in the blistering heat with no water, but the soldiers refuse to let anyone aid her. After 24 hours, the captain returns and lets her go, impressed by her will to live. The ladies now perform an orchestra every night for the colonel and sergeant, who have grown to admire their music over time. They even give them two soap bars. It's been two years since the inmates first arrived. They are transferred to a separate less developed area of the island, but are not informed of the reason for the transfer. They spot a group of women having afternoon tea outside a mansion, and assume they are the mistresses. To Rosemary's surprise, she notices her husband among the detainees brought by the Japanese, which implies only one thing, they are preparing to execute him. She sobs her way to the new place, knowing she'll never see the love of her life again. At new location, they're forced to remain in abandoned houses with no bedding. Due to the scarcity of food, the women are forced to consume snakes and grasshoppers. Malnutrition and consuming raw meat cause many to fall ill. Rosemary loses her will to live after witnessing her husband with the Japanese, she fasts for days and cries all night. She eventually dies, along with Mrs. Roberts and tens of other inmates. By the end of a few months, a field near the sheds has transformed into a graveyard, and only a handful of people who had come from the boat remain. They have practically forgotten their lives before being taken, but they have also learned a lot at the camp. On August 24, 1945, the colonel gathers everyone, and stands on top of a table to announce that the war has ended. He expresses regret, and promises that he did his best for the prisoners. The Japanese soldiers depart the checkpoint, freeing the inmates to do whatever they want. The women celebrate their release by jumping dancing and cheering. The survivors are rescued within two weeks, and flown to Singapore, 
from where they are flown back to their respective countries. Even after their release, the survivors remain friends. The end. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Turn on the notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out.